Okay, well, it's wonderful to see everybody on. We uh, we have a full schedule this evening. There's uh, much to cover and uh, so little time. We had a few questions that came through, uh, three questions, and all of them were very good questions. We have two wonderful topics, the kingdom now and uh, looking at critical race theory and cancel culture. Uh, both are deserving of uh, probably a few hours apiece. And we'll see what we can do to at least uh, discuss one and try to uh, introduce. But before we get started, we want to go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Brother John Varghese, do you think you can open up with a word of prayer for us? Our Father, we come to that presence this evening. Thank you for the time thou hast given to us together in this manner. Dear Lord, in thy name we come to look into thy word that is given to us as the time that we are living is difficult and is getting darker every day. Help us, dear Lord, the light of the word of God as well as the Holy Spirit may inspire us to live a life that is holy and useful for thy kingdom. Bless the time together and especially, dear Lord, uh, uh, blessed brothers, uh, those who are especially taking the questions and answering, that uh, it may not be a time for us to learn more, but maybe that will be applying in our life, that will be useful for our own life, as well as uh, for thy kingdom. We ask thy blessings upon the time. In the precious name, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and get right into our topics. Uh, again, we do have some questions, but um, we want to make sure that we try to get our topics uh, at, at minimum started so that we can build a solid foundation, and surely we will have to discuss um, critical race theory and cancel culture even into next session. So I want to start off, instead of starting with questions, I want to start off with uh, the Kingdom Now theology. Uh, so it's an interesting theology, and, and Dr. Alexander, you mentioned a little bit about it, but certainly something that is uh, very prominent in our culture today. So I was wondering if you can go into some more detail about this Kingdom Now theology, especially since you've been talking about uh, the joys of the Kingdom and how we can even enjoy the Kingdom Now, I think, is even what you mentioned a few a few weeks ago. Of course, not the same as the Kingdom Now theology. We want to make sure we make that distinction as we discuss that, so that we are not uh, misrepresenting uh, these two words together. So, Brother uh, Dr. Alexander, can you go ahead and please share a little bit about the Kingdom Now theology? Uh, yes, Brother Raymond, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we have been studying in detail about the various aspects of the Kingdom. And uh, in one sense, we are the kingdom citizens in a spiritual sense, waiting for the visible, literal, millennial kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. But there are many uh, Christian groups or so-called Christian groups, uh, some of them uh, with little radical theologies, uh, believe in the kingdom now teaching. Now, the Kingdom Now teaching, if you, you know, search uh, for more details on Kingdom Now teaching, uh, it is all kind of spread in different camps with different, uh, differing interpretations. So one group that believes in Kingdom Now theology believes it in a particular way. Another group believes in Kingdom Now theology, they believe it in a little bit different way. So there are variations uh, within this theology. Uh, many charismatic groups have embraced the Kingdom Now theology. The emerging church movement, the liberal churches, they all believe in Kingdom Now theology, but maybe with a little bit uh, uh, differences in their uh, specific uh, uh, theological points. But to summarize it for our benefit and for our purpose, 
the basic theology is that God has lost control over the world to Satan when Adam and Eve sinned. So things did not go according to God's plan and purpose. So God lost his control. So God is trying to create or, or reestablish his control over the world by creating a special group of people. And some would say this group is the church. Some would say uh, anyone who uh, fights for social justice and righteousness and for the good, the good things, you know, uh, from a human perspective, the good things to pervade this universe, this, this world. So either it is the church or it is the covenant people or it is a special group in the church called overcomers. Uh, another charismatic name is um, after the book of Joel, Joel's prophecy, Joel's army. Uh, another name some of them use is missional communities. So God is creating a special group of people through missional communities creating specific Christian communities in our culture so that through us, God can establish his kingdom. So that is the gist of the kingdom now uh, uh, theology. So this is the, that is the basic foundation. That is God is establishing his kingdom today. So we don't have to wait for a literal kingdom. We don't have to wait for a millennial kingdom. That is all just symbolic. It is just a concept, uh, an utopian concept about what God can do. So we are the agents and uh, the church is building that kingdom today or the covenant communities are building the kingdom today or the overcomers are building the uh, kingdom today. So we may build the kingdom by reforming social institution, fighting against racial inequality, you know, uh, so all these types of theologies are tied to the kingdom now theology among uh, uh, various Christian groups and also radical uh, liberation type of uh, theologies. So uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, we are actually handing over the kingdom to him because we are building it here today. So he will be so excited to come into the kingdom which we are building on his behalf. So we will welcome him into his kingdom built by us. It's so ridiculous, you know. People who do not have a solid biblical theology or foundation may find it very liberating, very exciting and a very novel truth. But those who take the word of God seriously, we know that this is a kind of very nonsensical and there is uh, nothing to be excited about it. And it is not going to uh, uh, happen uh, in this way. Now, in some, some extreme forms of charismatic uh, uh, kingdom now theology, they believe that uh, Jesus' second coming will be in two stages, but it is very different from the rapture and the second coming, which we understand from the scriptures. According to them, the two stages will be first through the believers, that is the, you know, uh, uh, through the believers who are building up the kingdom. So the Lord will work with them in building up the kingdom. So the Lord's presence is there as they build up the kingdom. And another way the Lord is coming is through the chosen apostles and prophets who are in the front line of this kingdom building. So the apostles and prophets and the overcomers who are in the forefront of this kingdom building, they will purge the earth, they will purify the earth or evil influences. And when Jesus Christ returns, all his enemies would have been completely defeated and the Lord will have an easy coming, you know, will be, his coming will be 
very easy to receive that kingdom. Now, so some of them reject, uh, you know, all of them uh, reject the understanding of the literal rapture. It is uh, people being caught up in rapturous feeling when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to receive his kingdom. So, so there are different, uh, all of the kingdom theology groups may not believe it in exactly the different way, but this is basically the framework in which uh, uh, they operate. That is the church or commun missional communities, overcomers, Joel's army, and the special uh, group of apostles, prophets. We are building the kingdom today through social reform, so through preaching the gospel and uh, through, you know, um, uh, cultural purification and things like that. So that is basically that. Then in the evangelical circles, you know, uh, there, there are other views in relation to the kingdom. That is uh, the replacement theology that is more popular. And, uh, you know, they are not radical as the kingdom now theology, but the replacement theology is that the church has replaced Israel and the fulfillment of the prophecies to Israel and the church is fulfilling all that. So the church has replaced Israel. The promises of Israel are spiritually being fulfilled in the church. So that is very common in different forms among the millennial theologians, among covenant theologians, among the some of the uh, Presbyterian Calvinistic type of theology. It's not all of them, but this replacement theology is popular. So that is uh, another form, you know, uh, Israel is being replaced by the, uh, by, by the church. And in that way, Israel uh, does not have any special place, national Israel in the program of God. There is another term, many of you may be familiar, reconstructionism, you know, that is reconstructionism is we are here, the church is, to, is here to create a uh, biblical society with the worldwide uh, influence of social reform and, uh, uh, you know, that will pave the way for Christ's coming. So again, it basically means that the church is uh, uh, building the uh, kingdom. I mentioned about replacement theology, uh, another name some people used for replacement theology is supersessionism, supersessionism. That is, the church uh, has replaced Israel or the church is the expansion of Israel and supersedes over all the promises made to Israel. One more theology in relation to kingdom now, dominion theology, that is through social and political activism, Christians should take over the government and the political structure of our country and society and reconstructed it according to the laws of God. You know, it is also sometimes referred to us as theonomy, you know, theos God and nomos law. So we are here to implement God's laws. Now this dominion theology has unnecessarily created a lot of confusion in the world, especially in America and uh, many liberals and the media misunderstand evangelicals are the proponents of dominion theology and through our political candidates and party we are trying to take over the government you know so that is the, so the satan has done a lot of exploitation of these things so that uh, the uh, many politicians even you know many of our own congressmen and senators and the media, many of them have misunderstood the 
evangelical Christians and our dispensational theology as, per, as something related to dominion theology. We do not believe in dominion theology at all, but since they are not biblically or theologically literate, they cannot make the difference, you know. So they believe that is why they are always anti-evangelical, you know, anti-faith and anti-biblical because they know about dominion theology and we, they think that we are trying to take over, implement the Ten Commandments and, uh, you know, eradicate uh, all unbelievers from this earth and prepare the way for Christ's coming. No, we only believe in the dominion of Jesus Christ, not in the dominion of the church, not in the dominion of believers in world affairs or in politics. The dominion of the Lord Jesus Christ will happen when he returns and only when he returns and establishes his mighty and powerful kingdom upon this earth. But he is omnipotent and he is sovereign and he is ruling today and he is accomplishing his purpose. And even now, nobody can stand against his dominion and authority. But the literal dominion authority will be established upon the earth when our Lord Jesus Christ comes back. Now is the time of the Gentiles. It is the dominion of the Gentiles, the Gentile politics, the Gentile religions, the Gentile kingdoms, the Gentile economic system, the Gentile worldviews. And those things will be completely replaced and dominated, dominion and will be defeated when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. And we, we are not, you know, trying to dominate anything. I hope if somebody is listening to me, they probably, you know, if confused, uh, 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 I hope and pray that they may have a clear uh, understanding. So Satan takes, you know, certain bullet points from here and there, some truths of the word of God coming through the mouth of various Christian groups and try to uh, seed, uh, try to plant seeds of contention, competition, betrayal, deception, and to create persecution against the church in different ways. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, brother. Dr. John Matthew, I'll get to you in just one second. Um, so I wanted to just ask a question and bring out a point. Uh, and so in, in making this observation, Dr. Alexander, you can just uh, mention to me if this, if this makes sense or, or what you make of it. Uh, as we consider this issue um, and uh, the fact that uh, the pendulum is swinging so far to one direction, uh, specifically on the social aspect, you mentioned that it's a social work and then they almost seem to tag on the gospel, mm -hmm. uh, whereas maybe for evangelicals, evangelicals want to uh, solely focus on the gospel, but then neglect the social implications of the gospel. Because the reality is that when you preach the gospel, you're going to deal with social issues. There's no way around that. People have problems, and the social implications should not, meet, should not be neglected. I want to bring that up in connection with another topic that uh, is one that uh, I often uh, quote you on, and that is living a pneumatic Christianity or a spirit-filled life, spirit-filled Christian life. Um, I didn't see anybody cringe when I said that, uh, but there, there's some video off, so maybe some, uh, you know, cringe a little bit as soon as I talked about that. But so often, uh, even with us and, and people that are uh, conservative Christians and, you know, in our circles, Sometimes that idea of discussing the Holy Spirit and being uh, led by the Spirit and having a Spirit-filled life, uh, sometimes it, it seems as though we're discussing uh, more of a charismatic view, and that's just not the case. Again, the pendulum swung uh, on either side in both of those scenarios concerning the Spirit. So my question to you then, as I made those two parallels, do you think that uh, we sometimes neglect uh, the gospel? or going into the communities and reaching out to people with the gospel because we're afraid of the social implications that will come with that. 
people mm. with in, in their their current situations and circumstances coming into our churches. Uh, do you think that that's something that we should be concerned about or that we have a problem with? Mm. Uh, is it the question directed to me? Okay. <laughs> All right, sure. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, uh, uh, you are right, Raymond. You know, uh, when we say that we are not into dominion theology or to kingdom building today, that does not excuse us from our social and other moral responsibilities in relation to our witnessing and evangelism and being salt of the earth and light of the world. It is an integral part of our mission, you know, uh, to uh, preach and to uh, demonstrate and, and, and to stand for biblical justice. And I'm using the word biblical justice because the Bible uses, Bible encourages us for practical uh, justice and righteousness in the society to stand with the oppressed and also to, you know, uh, to be compassionate to those who are suffering. So uh, I don't want to use the word social justice because today social justice has different connotations, you know, but uh, uh, biblical justice uh, is something, uh, an integral part of our faith. Uh, so when we witness for the Lord Jesus Christ and when we preach the gospel, it uh, uh, impels us, compels us for appropriate uh, social reform, social action, and witnessing, standing for the truth, and try to support people who need our support and our encouragement, those who are oppressed and those who are going through difficulties and trouble. So, Many a times uh, due to various circumstances and limitations, uh, our own incompetency in this matter, lack of knowledge or lack of burden, or maybe because of fear, we might have shied away from, you know, some of these responsibilities. But uh, in many places, uh, the church also have been involved in helping people, eradicating poverty, you know, feeding the hungry, uh, being on the side of the oppressed minorities and the world around, the Christians have done commendable job than any other religion or any other groups, uh, humanitarian work, medical work, uh, you know, all those things. So, uh, so we have biblical justice. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. And uh, both the Old Testament and the New Testament teaches us about uh, our social and moral responsibilities to our neighbors, uh, to the communities around. Everywhere, everyone may not be able to do this or implement this equally, but wherever and whenever possible, uh, we must be available, we must be happy to the best of our ability to do it. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Um, Dr. John Matthew, so you've heard his comments. Uh, do you have anything you would like to add uh, to, to any of these topics that he mentioned? Yeah, I agree with uh, Dr. Alexander. I said, although we teach a scripture, and we proclaim the gospel, it is uh, imperative on our part to do the social justice also to help the poor. It's incorporated already in our day-to-day -day, uh, biblical principles. So that's nothing new. So the problem is that uh, Dr. Alexander explained. So the church is going through a very critical time now. So I know many young people grew up in the assembly when they go to the metropolitan cities and they go to emerging church and emerging churches, kingdom now theology. So Galatians 5, 9, the Holy Spirit give us a warning. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. That means the evil doctrines crept into the churches and corrupting the whole churches and misleading our young generation. 1980s have witnessed the rise to prominence of a unique blend of theology. 
There are various names for them. Dr. Alexander already explained it, and I'm going to uh, one more time. Dominion theology, theonomy, Christian reconstructionism, and kingdom now. They are loosely organized with a hybrid theology. At present, there are more than a dozen strands of faith, dozen branches of faith. They combine the tenets of socialism, mysticism, critical race theology, FIPO and Calvinism, reformed theology, covenant theology, charismatic theology, and environmentalism, and social justice. The manifesto is very, uh, very interesting. Poor people will be liberated from poverty. Minorities would be treated with the dignity. Sinners would be loud, not resented or criticized. Cancer and pandemics will be eliminated. They believe in collective salvation instead of individual salvation. There was a popular book published in 1996. The title was It Takes a Village, written by then the First Lady of America, Hillary Rodham Clinton. It advocated a society which meets all of a child's needs. Kingdom Now believes that the church is presently experiencing the messianic kingdom. This is preached by emerging church or emergent church in America and Europe, and also in Asia, also some parts of Asia too. So Dominion theology, Dr. Alessandro already explained, believe the dominions over every area of life has been restored by the first coming of Jesus Christ. Since we are now in the kingdom, our task is calling of believers to reclaim the rule of Christ on planet Earth. Theonomy teaches that the Old Testament laws should be implemented today. They oppose the separation of church and the state. They teach that as the body of Christ, we are also Christ. In other words, we have his divine nature. Most of them don't believe in a literal rapture. I, Dr. Alexander already explained that also. All prophecies regarding the future of Israel, both in Old Testament and New Testaments, actually apply to the church today. Prior to the second coming of super prophets of the kingdom now, all overcomers will purge the earth of all evil influences. Jesus cannot return until all his enemies have been put under the feet of the church. The teachings of the kingdom now is that God lost control of the universe. I already explained, Dr. Alexander explained that. When Adam committed sin, um, the God lost the control of the universe. What kind of ludicrous uh, theology is that? Do you remember uh, Kenneth Copeland mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, killed the coronavirus uh, with a supernatural heat on March 29, 2020? Mm -hmm. So the two days before, uh, another prophet, T.B. Joshua, in Nigeria also, March 27, he also killed uh, uh, is uh, uh, coronavirus. So, coronavirus exposed and destroyed 120 year old fraud that has been perpetrated on the Christian church. This utopian myth misled uh, millions of people by promising false hope and they over promised and underperformed. So, do you believe that, you know, so this, these prophets? Jesus Christ need these peoples, uh, the people I mentioned, you know, all these poor super frauds to reclaim the earth. No. So they cannot, there, is, there are no miracles. This is a hoax perpetrated on the church and uh, uh, church became a laughing stock among Hindus, Christians, and uh, atheists. So this dominion theology is a, from pit of hell and misleading people. So since uh, Dr. Alexander explained also, this is my input about it, and we have to be very careful, and uh, our local church and parents should be careful where our children are attending when they go to college, what church they are attending. Uh, mm. That's all back to you, Raymond. Yes. Yeah, thank you, brother. You know, the, the emerging church movement um, and everything that you mentioned, it, it has a certain appeal to it to so many. Uh, and all that you've mentioned thus far, both of you, uh, is something that is not new, by the way, but it has a very fresh feel to so many. Uh, and so does the next topic. The next topic, critical race theory, is not a new one. Um, so we're going to go to Dr. John Matthew for this one. 
to start off with, uh, and he'll explain it. But everyone needs to understand that this is not a new concept or topic. Uh, it is. Uh, it came about in you know in the 70s and 80s, and and I think was formalized in the late 80s or so. Uh, but uh, the point is that it seems to be regaining prominence. And it's something that we need to be very careful with. That is critical race theory and uh, and then cancel culture as well. So, Dr. John Matthew, can you go ahead and explain for us what this is? And I know you can't finish this topic, but at least yeah. we can get started uh, this evening. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Brayman. This is also the most important subject. When I turn on TV or open the newspaper every day, every minute, I see that so-and-so has been canceled cancel culture, the uh, professors have to resign their job and they are going to shut down or boycott so-and-so from television and uh, university professors have to resign because uh, critical race theory, uh, when I go to bookstore, you know, I used to see, you know, this uh, investment for dummies or, you know, home repair for dummies. That's not an offensive or anything like that. That means a simple a simple language they try to explain. And so I have a, you know, for made a definition for dummies, what is critical race theology. So in a simple fashion, in one sentence means hate America and hate each other. That's the definition of critical race theology. That's a, I came up with a definition. Francis Schaeffer described how ideas escape the ivory towers of universities and think tank eventually to shape how ordinary people think, speak, and view their world. In 2020, one idea made that journey to in record time. The critical race theory, you know, for a convenient site, also called it CRT, once relegated to academic papers, classroom discussions has become a day-to-day -day word in our life. The critical theory offers a diametrically opposite view that are consistent with the biblical values. The critical race uh, the uh, theory describes who we are, what is wrong with the world, and prescribes solutions that are opposite to biblical principles. Many people of goodwill desire to combat injustice, just like you and me. We don't like injustice as Christians. We want to eradicate racism, and we don't practice, and we don't tolerate it as a good Christians. And, uh, and uh, climate, uh, and uh, uh, eliminate the oppression. We don't, we don't believe in oppression either. George Santayana, a Spanish philosopher, stated one time, I think I quoted this, uh, his uh, George Santayana statement in one of my books in the beginning. Those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. So our culture over the past 75 years has become less uh, literate, less read, and it has forgotten the lessons of the past while calling others ignorant uh, that's we did that. You know, consequently, when the ideas uh, from the old serpent repacked for today's are presented, they are accepted because they sound good to the unlearned ear. Uh, Proverbs fourteen twelve. It's a there's a verse. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. In Colossians chapter two eight, also there is a good verse. Also, see. Uh, to it that no one take you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition. See, human traditions are rampant here in America today. Many Christians embrace uh, intersectionality train, unaware that it leads to catastrophic crash. What is, what is intersectionality? It's a common word in an average escape crept into the English language. I also uh, made a definition for dummies, for simple definition for that. What is intersectionality is an international association of victims. So that's the intersectionality. That means uh, they teach victimology. The concept that uh, oppression, every oppression is linked, a group of marginalized people or victims. So critical race uh, theory is a worldview that divides humanity into two competing tribes, the oppressor and the oppressed. The oppressor is anyone who has a real or perceived advantage over the others. Karl Marx similarly divided humanity into two groups, 
that's why i said you know there is nothing new under the sun solomon says you know so repackaged marxism repackaged in the critical race theology he says bourgeois those who are born in kerala we is the daily you said bourgeois means you know who has a living who has a house and he has enough money to live you know it's called a bourgeois it's a french word a b o u r g o i s bourgeois and the plural is bourgeoisie the bourgeois means capitalist and the proletariat or working class so critical race theology or intersectionality teach that a powerful always oppress the powerless Consequently, the oppressed uh, possess a greater degree of moral superiority. The oppressors have become numb to the plight of the oppressed. The oppressors of the white folks are ignorant and clueless of the plight of the oppressed. It is uh, their social DNA. So if you know the history, you know that um, Louis Farrakh and Malcolm X and many black activists uh, have stated in the past, if you want to see devil, you see a white man. So it's now it's with Raman nowadays. People may belong to more than one oppressed group. I have I prepared a short list of the oppressors, you know, so sometimes uh, we also may be included in that group, you know. So heterosexuals and uh, the oppressors, whites, males, and Europeans, then oppressed people, who are victims. So the list is, I prepared gays and lesbians, transgender, blacks, females, and other people of color. A white heterosexual male would be the proto-oppressor or the arch-typical oppressor. He would have the least amount of moral authority as well as the greatest amount of moral responsibility because he's part of an oppressive tribe that has mistreated others down through the ages. When speaking into matters of race or culture, the white heterosexual male must shut up and listen. A black heterosexual male would have more moral authority because being black, he is a member of two oppressed group. The difference between social justice and real justice yeah, we all know that justice, you know, so it's a natural law. Justice based on either Bible or the rule of law. Ask the question, one question, was a crime committed and who committed? It's a social justice, this a critical theory people, they ask like this, why did the person commit crime? And against who? Depending on one's level of moral authority and oppression, one has a greater privilege than others and may get a pass for his crime. Writing and looting are often described as reparations. Uh, this business also, business also deserves this type of punishment. You know that uh, last year, you know, six months about the writing in uh, two dozen cities in America by Antifa and Black Lives Matter. You know, so the mayors and others, you know, sympathetical came and said that, you know, well, they are venting their anger, you know, so because of the generations of suffering and the slavery, you know, they wanted to release. The, the irony is that uh, I see the Black Lives Matter movement, the young white male and the females, they were going and burning down the black businesses. See the irony, just like the abortion clinics established the black neighborhood, you know, so you just, uh, you can figure out uh, what is happening there. So the critical uh, race theology create a culture of revenge, also called a cancel culture. Cancel culture is rampant in society today. Uh, uh, critical race theology assign moral values to people on the basis of their skin color. If you talk against it, you will be boycotted or they will ex exile you. There's another day-to-day -day world, woke, W-O-O-K-E, woke or wokeness. Before 2014, the call to stay woke was unheard of. It originated in 2014 after the police killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Stay woke became a watchword for Black Lives Matter movement. They mean keeping watch for police brutality. Christianity and the critical race uh, uh, theory are two opposing worldviews. CRT sees salvation as a social liberation, activism and protest, protest. 
it insists on penance, reparation, and comeuppance. Comeuppance also is a simple word. Come, C O M E, uppance means uh, you, uh, you know, so if somebody, uh, a black person beat up a white person, that means it's a comeuppance uh, for him, you know, that he deserved that punishment. That's the meaning of comeuppance. It is a walk salvation, devoid of praise. As a result of these uh, fatal flaws, critical race theology makes wrong diagnosis and prescribe a deadly poison. A new order can only start with a new life through Jesus Christ, changing us from inside out. The Bible clearly states that, uh, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. And you can give money and do other things, you know, and uh, uh, help the poor people. No. And if you accept the Lord Jesus Christ, he will change your heart. You become a new creation. Then everything else will come automatically. Many Americans have a narrow view of the world problems. They think that if they can resolve the problems in America, then the rest of the world would be automatically reformed such as climate change. In one meeting session, I made that, and racial issues. Still, minorities and low caste people are beaten and killed in India. Even last week I saw, they were, you know, the going and the, even our many assemblies. So India has, a, you know, how many the population, you know, the, the, you have to understand the population of United States is three, 328 million. India, 1.38 billion. China, one point. Uh, 43 billion, Indonesia 273 million, Pakistan 220 uh, million, Bangladesh 164 million, Brazil 212 million, Nigeria more than 200 million. So all these people are there. What about racism there? So they still India. The India is uh, set up. The system set up the Brahmin society. The Brahmins are high caste, and the minorities and the Christians are persecuted and uh, downtrodden and they persecute every day. What do they do? If you solve all the problem here, what about all these billions of people? So this is a pipe dream by Marxist and socialist and to destroy America, just like I stated, you know, the meaning for them is, you know, hate America and hate each other. That's the critical race theology. And uh, they, they are not doing anything to eliminate the uh, racism in other, other parts of China, they are eradicating genocidal, genocide is going on China about Muslims and Burma also, many other countries. They don't raise a finger about it. Uh, that's all I have, uh, Raymond, back to you. Thank you, brother. Uh, welcome. You know, this is a, a very relevant topic and something that deserves a lot of attention. Uh, I appreciate you giving the four dummies definitions. <laughs> That's uh, <laughs> I expect nothing less from you, brother. Let's put it that way. Um, so, no, Dr. No, Alexander Gideon, to the bookstore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Alexander, I, uh, I know that you have some thoughts on this. So I want to go ahead and turn to you uh, on your thoughts uh, on what was discussed by Dr. John Matthew. Okay, yeah, Dr. John Matthew has explained it very well, humorously, and at the same time, soberly about, uh, you know, what is really going on. Uh, we know that even many of us, you know, in my own age group, uh, many of us have not really heard about these things before. Uh, it is uh, probably, it was there for the last uh, maybe 40 years, it was there. And uh, the origin is probably the Marxist, the Marxist ideology. But as Raymond said, in my reading and study, I found that it was in 1989, there was an official workshop on the CRT, and then it gained momentum. But within the last couple of years only, this is cre really creating a lot of issues in our society and it is becoming uh, very, very a popular ideology. So I don't want to repeat all what uh, we have already heard. I just want to share a couple of more insight into it as I personally see it. That is, uh, you know, Dr. John Matthew explained it well, 
uh, their fundamental ideology is that all the laws of this world, all the social institution, all the religions, all the legal systems, and uh, uh, all economic systems, and all political systems, majority of the political system, is constructed in, in such a way as by one race, one group, one color, to dominate others, or in other words, you know, it is the white. So, you know, all the systems in the world are in an underhanded way, these systems are conveniently made and orchestrated and planned and arranged so that this one race can dominate and suppress all the other group. That is the foundational issue behind it. You know, that is why it is seen in politics, it is seen in religion, it is seen in economics, it is seen in other social cultural ideologies. Because, you know, uh, one group, one race, one color, they are dominating, trying to dominate all the oppressed group. So why we have the, this economic system? It is to suppress some people and to dominate. Why we have this educational system? It is to dominate somebody, you know, and to um, manipulate and to uh, per perpetuate your personal interests. So this elite group wants to control everything. So they are suppressing all others. Now, when people hear that, especially minorities and those who are genuinely being suppressed for, you know, in, in an unjust way due to the fall of man in different ways, they all think, okay, this is right and we need to fight against it. So. Uh, different uh, groups come up with their agenda, you know, in relation to fighting against this problem. So they all join hand to hand and become a force, uh, creating violence and social anarchy and uh, racial prejudice and uh, fanning the flames of hatred, everything. If you ask them, they do not know anything about it, you know. So they know that they are being deceived to believing that somebody is trying to oppress and suppress you always. Don't trust any of these systems. Now, that is what this is all about. Now, the, the second thing is in relation to us, to our families, to our churches, assemblies. That is, we know that many of our young people are attending uh, churches outside the assembly circles due to various reasons. And I believe most of them are going to good churches. But even in some evangelical churches now, at least I can think of four or five pastors whom I have respected in the past, for popularity, they all have embraced this CRT and woke theology because their attendance, their membership is made of these students, these young families, young adults, you know, and uh, they all are into this ideology. So these pastors, they do not want to offend them in any way. They want to keep them in their fold. And, uh, uh, you know, they, these pastors and leaders want their support. So, even in the last uh, couple of years, especially in the last year, it is unbelievable that some of these great servants of the Lord who used to preach the word of God, you know, pure and clear, they are preaching this ridiculous, nonsensical theory from their pulpit because many of the young people, they are biblically illiterate. They don't have a theological understanding. They don't take the time to really study into the word of God, you know, because it is painstaking, it is sacrificial, it is time consuming. They don't do that. So they are theologically illiterate. So they buy into all these things and they, 
think that as Christians, we must fight for uh, social justice, you know, but they do not know the deceptions behind it. We are for biblical justice, social equality, for the liberation of the oppressed in a decent way, in whichever way we can do that. But that is not with the support of the CRT or godless philosophies, which only believes in social liberation without any kind of spiritual uh, liberation. So even many of our own young people are deceived into it because of their lack of understanding of Bible and theology. I'm very sorry to say that because many of them go to such churches, contribute to those churches, they are fans of those pastors, but they do not discern that what they are hearing is wrong. You know, they cannot support it because if you analyze it biblically, it is absolutely wrong. So it is a very painful, it's a very delicate, and it is a very uh, difficult uh, situation we are facing in the world. No gospel, no spiritual element, it is all through social liberation and the church's main responsibility is social reform, not to preach the gospel, you know. So uh, even if it is the gospel, it has to be a liberational theological gospel. Otherwise, it is not gospel. So uh, that kind of ideology is very much wedded into the system. Uh, so it is Satan's deceptive scheme. You know, people with good intention to alleviate the suffering, to help the oppressed, but they operate on a, from a wrong platform. So we must be vigilant about it and we must be discerning in relation to these matters. Thank you, brother. Yeah, wonderful thoughts there uh, to complement what Dr. John Matthew was saying. Now, we have a few questions that came in uh, from our, our previous session and uh, two of them uh, kind of go together and we'll see if we get to those. But the, the question that I wanna to get to first, as we do have some time left, uh, it's concerning uh, online meetings. Now, this is something that um, you know has, has been discussed over and over, but uh, just wanted to get kind of a last final uh, position on this. Uh, I don't think we need to spend a lot of time uh, on this answer, but we do need to address it. And, and that is the concern of many of the viability or uh, whether or not uh, online meetings are appropriate specifically for um, church gatherings, right? Uh, Lord's Supper and, and so on. So for either one of you, brethren, I'm sure both of you have positions on this, but either one of you, it's an open question. So uh, please, whoever would like to answer. Just like I said before, there is nothing new under the sun. <laughs> the, Christ, the Christians have been uh, <laughs> behind, you know, all the when the technology came. One, I remember once I uh, spoke at Colonials, you know, I stated one statement. I don't see any horse cart there, you know. So I, I don't see as long as I don't see any horses and cart there, you know. So I, I see all the cars there. You all embrace the modern technology. So some people uh, for over the years, you know, they claim to be super spiritual, you know, they are against technology. And people told me in the 90s, you know, this is not, email is not good for Christians, uh, for believers. So now they are sending five or 10 emails a day, you know, so they never apologized. So when they make such, such a, a foolish statements, when they change the position, they have a, a obligation to go and say testimony. In the past, I have made many blunders and foolish statements. You know, I became sober. You know, I wanted to apologize to God and to, to you all for misleading. You know, so people play this uh, super saint uh, hood and let people say, you know, online meeting is satanic and 666. And, uh, and I have seen the same people on the computer 
five hours a day, you know, so debating with somebody. Uh, so those type of things, you know, always there, you know, when the radio came, you know, they, yeah, this not what Christians, what happened? So finally, they came to census, you know, and, uh, and then radio broadcast through Voice of America and uh, went to millions of Muslims and the communist countries and were converted. So Christians understood after many years, you know, the importance. Same thing with television or satanic, you know. So then we have more than 100 countries, you know, they are broadcasting. And the same uh, thing with the uh, social media. We are reaching people in Pakistan, Muslim countries, and the other places where when we can even dream about uh, those kind of things. So this, I strongly believe God gave all this technology for gospel work. This misuse is, of course, you know, every everything, you know. So just one example, I always say, sex is, God gave sex for procreation and uh, enjoyment. But... 90, 80 percent of the people misuse it. That doesn't mean that you know sex is, uh, you know, bad and you don't you know destroy you know your uh, boys comes you know you, you don't do any special stuff like that. So we have to ask believers to, how to overcome all these things. What is our priority? So when they say that uh, technology is not good, online meeting, why we have this online meet? because of pandemic. Uh, corona, nothing else, you know, so it's not permanent, you know, so these arguments, they want to impress us and uh, show that uh, they are super saints and uh, uh, Pharisees, modern day Pharisees, that's my opinion, mm -hmm. you know, so Dr. Alexander, if he has some uh, comments about it, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I have, you know, the last year when this uh, problem uh, started, you know, I have published articles and uh, many people ask me and have uh, you know, written on it and various things, you know, I just want to be very brief, you know. Um, I don't think uh, what we hear against the uh, Zoom meetings or online meetings, you know, uh, through the help of technology, uh, the against arguments have anything to do with spirituality, anything to do with the Bible. It all comes from personal legalistic bend of mind and personal self-created religiosity, you know, it has, it has no other basis. It has no scriptural basis, absolutely. Uh, it comes from personal religiosity and legalism, number one. Number two, if a person doesn't feel comfortable in participating in, you know, uh, meeting through technology, he or she absolutely has the freedom and he, they don't have to uh, deceive their conscience, they can abstain from it. But it should not be right on their part to make a doctrine out of that for all the assemblies or for others. Uh, number three, uh, the online meetings or through the help of technology is not the preference of any church even a liberal church. It is not the preference of any of the assemblies yes. with, uh, which we are associated. It was because of an exceptional situation that came upon us through the pandemic. And even in the midst of those exceptional situations, God's people wanted to gather together and the Lord enlightened their minds to use the technology available so that they can at least continue with the meetings at least in a limited way. I praise the Lord for it, and I'm thankful to the Lord for giving most of the assemblies uh, that understanding and vision. And some of the, you know, assemblies or some groups, they may have their own arguments and, uh, you know, but it has nothing to do with biblical, theological, or doctrinal. So we can reject it 100%. It has no validity at all, other than that it is a part of their personal uh, religiosity. And we respect that. If they don't want, that is fine. But we look forward to the day when, you know, praying that all these problems may be over soon and we may be able to gather together in person. That is, of course, our longing and our prayer. In many places, Thank you, brother. I to, appreciate uh, that. Oh. Yeah, our, our assembly has been gathering at least, uh, you know, on Wednesdays and Sundays. 
some assemblies have opened, others are thinking about it. So, according to the best uh, uh, discerning uh, decision of the elders of each assembly, they will make the right decision. Thank you, brother. I uh, appreciate your answers to that. Um, certainly something that um, each of us have been dealing with and, and I have already answered or, or have been pondering. And um, so appreciate your, your comments there. It, uh, it's eight o'clock, so <clears throat> I think instead of trying to get to the other two questions that uh, deserve a little bit of time to, to answer thoroughly, I think we will go ahead and conclude here. I want to make a mention that uh, for anybody that does have questions to please send them in. Uh, it's, it's nice if we can try to uh, organize the questions so that we can perhaps answer a few on the same topic at the same time. It is very helpful. It is, uh, I think it's good time management for us so that we can try to get the most out of our time together. Uh, it is a very short time, just an hour, and yet we try to accomplish much. So hopefully it is a, a profitable time for each of you. So please send your questions in. You can send them to myself at raymond at marylandoutreach.org. You can send them to Dr. John Matthew. You can send them to Dr. Alexander Goodian. Um, or you can send them via text, whatever it might be. You can send them to us, and we always discuss them prior to and try to organize that the best we can. So next week, we'll take a look at uh, more of this cancer culture um, and critical race theory and try to dig a little bit deeper into that and get some questions. Uh, I'm sure there are many questions concerning that. So we want to leave time next week for plenty of, of questions in response to this. And even the Kingdom Now theology, which uh, the reality is that the two almost uh, go hand in hand. Uh, so something that we need to be aware of, something we need to be very careful with. We will go ahead and conclude there. We'll have a, a prayer. I uh, just want to thank Dr. Alexander Kudian, uh, Dr. John Matthew, for Welcome. your time, your study, your efforts. Um, always appreciate it. Thank so you. So we'll go ahead and conclude with the word of prayer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, about um, Brother Paul, would you mind closing with a word of prayer for us? Right. Dear Father, we just thank you for this time that we had tonight to study your word. Lord, we know that we're all sinners. We all deserve the lake of fire forever. But we do just thank you that you showed love to us and gave your son so that we might have life forever. And Lord, we just thank you that each one of us can have this chance, this uh, choice to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, just Pray that you'd be with us in our lives, that we would be more biblically literate, that we would follow you more closely. Just pray that you would uh, bless Alexander Curian and John Matthew as they do this teaching. Just pray that uh, we all might be enlightened and grow closer to you and live a better testimony for you. We pray this in the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, just, Amen. Uh, you all have a wonderful evening. Uh, just uh, something on a lighter note for us.